morning, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to speak to you this morning. Um, I'm the director of Europeana Foundation. I'm a historian. Um, I'm an optimist. That's how I look at myself. I believe that it's true, you can be serious without a suit, as the people say in Google. I also believe that it doesn't mean that if you do wear a suit, you cannot have some progressive thoughts about what we can do in Europe. I'm a pragmatist and I'm also an opportunist, whenever that is necessary. And I think um, we have an incredible window of opportunity here. And that's re really going to be the main focus of my talk to explain to you why it's so important to act now. Uh, because cultural heritage can really be key to the regeneration of Europe, but it's our task to make sure that this is recognized in the next seven year plans of the European Union, which are being designed today. 10 years ago, the European Union took a bold and enlightened decision. It doesn't happen every day. It declined a very attractive proposition to have all our books digitized for free by Google. Instead, it decided that our cultural heritage was too important to be left to market forces alone to decide if and how our heritage is made available to its citizens. And from that big idea, Europeana was born. Ten years later, Europe has a platform where close to 4,000 libraries, museums, and archives have made over 50 million items of their collections available under open standards. And it's been working with civil society organizations like Wikimedia, like Creative Commons, to make all of this happen. Europeana became a slightly messy but thriving distributed network of expert hubs. Yes, Europeana has its flaws. It's not easy enough as a small archive to participate. We're facing some significant technological challenges. And not all the material is easy to find. But consider this, Europe did not look for a tech giant to solve what is really a fundamental Euro, uh, human right, unobstructed access to your cultural heritage. And that's the real power of a Europe based on values in action. Now note that this European distributed model for digital libraries has become an expert product, a cultural expert product that is being copied in the United States, in Brazil, in India, and most recently in Mexico. So we're doing something right here. Now Europe is facing some very significant challenges at the moment. If my German language understanding was correct, the previous speakers have already highlighted some of those. But here's my take on it. So after fascism and communism have collapsed as relevant schools of thought to navigate the world, the 21st century is hitting the boundaries of liberalism as well. We cannot rely anymore on market forces alone to solve our economic problems, let alone solve some fundamental issues about identity and social cohesion. Because what is Europe to its citizens beyond a common market? How does it protect self-determination of individual citizens in the face of rapid technological change? Now, this year is a very special year to us. It's the European Year of Cultural Heritage. I'm sure you've heard about that. But here's the thing. Do not think lightly of this. It's not just a program that you can discard and maybe participate uh, left and right in, in your own situation. This has surfaced your work to the attention of policymakers in Europe, to policymakers in your member states. It has led to the recognition that culture and the creative industries contribute more than 500 billion to the European economy. Now, this makes our sector larger than manufacturing and the automotive industry. When I heard these things, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> I had no idea. Cultural heritage is not only one of the biggest drivers of tourism, but 12 million people in Europe have a job in this sector. And even more importantly, it's the largest employer of young people in Europe. Did you know that? It's incredible. More importantly, it has highlighted the crossover impact of heritage into innovation, health, and well-being, which is the 
sketch that I'm showing you here today. Now, this recognition represents an immense opportunity for us at this point where the deck of cards is being reshuffled and decisions are being made for the next seven years, the so-called multi-annual framework 2021-2027 of the European Union. We need to live up to that as a sector. If culture really has this transformative power that we all talk about, surely we need to understand how we can create more of it. That's my pragmatist vision on that. How does the availability of culture create new jobs in the creative industry? How does it regenerate cities in smart, sustainable ways? So we're not just getting flooded by tourists in our capitals, but it actually is being spread evenly across our cultural cities, and that we're entertaining these people in interesting new ways using digital technologies. How does it support a vibrant, self-confident, and open European society? I think those are the big challenges we're facing. Now, those are big challenges, so let's break that down a little bit. Let's rescope the problem space we're in. Technology will continue to drastically change how we change our lives. That's a fact. We know that. But when we talk about this digital transformation, we should ask ourselves, transforming into what and how? I believe these are the questions that, for the next 10 years, will determine how we're going to be as Europeans uh, and as active citizens in this nation. So there are three things that I think we can do to make that happen. The first of all is access. We need to democratize access to our culture. The picture I'm showing you here tries to show that. Because first of all, we need to make that easy to use and open. Otherwise, the reach of any social or economic impact will be really limited to the privileged few. For cultural heritage institutions, this involves further shifting practices to the digital. While the shift has been progressing over the past 15 to 20 years, 300 million objects have been digitized. But the fact remains that we're still in the midst of shifting an operating system from digital uh, to digital. We're still operating largely from an analog paradigm, and we need to empower the public to make use, reuse, or put simply, do things with their heritage. Only one-third, that's what this picture shows you, of what we've digitized in Europe is even available on the web. Now, that to me is a shocking fact. Oh, that's right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I saw you notice. Do you want to raise a question? All right. So here it is. The big iceberg up down there is the undigitized material. 10% has been digitized. But only a third of that is available on the web at the moment. And even more shockingly, only 7% of what has been digitized is explicitly available for reuse on Wikipedia, on Europeana, and anywhere else that you want to reuse that. Now, what Europeana is fighting for is to increase that share. That's what we're doing. We help institutions with right statements, uh, making their material more attractive and more available on the web for anyone to reuse. But that takes an immense amount of effort still to be able to do that. The second thing is an innovation of infrastructure and community. Um, this needs to be community-based and reciprocal. Those are the two points I want to make. We need to make that work as a network rather than as individuals combining the best of the sector knowledges and practice. What does that mean in action? We need to develop infrastructure that safeguards not only unobstructed access to the material, but also the behavioral patterns of users. This includes developing standards such as right statements to guide institutions and individuals how they can reuse digital cultural heritage objects. And finally, it means that we develop, need to develop formats of interaction that empower citizens not only to consume, but to interact with their heritage on the web, in physical formats, anywhere that we can. Yeah. So what about the future? We heard many speak about the importance of cultural heritage to the social and economic environment, and that makes a lot of sense. Here's some facts again. We spend much less than 1% of our GDP, our gross domestic product, on a sector that is set to contribute over 4.5% of the GDP in the form of cultural tourism, creative businesses, and regeneration of cities. Now, any businessman will tell you that is an incredibly solid return on investment. But at real value, the gold mine of culture 
lies beyond the obvious return and is embedded in such concepts as identity, well-being, and behavioral change. This potential, however, is only unlocked in environments that are inherently participatory, that empower people to engage. So what of these environments, what of the future, if we do not set the agenda together? New radical technologies such as artificial intelligence are on the verge of breaking through if they're not already in there. Imagine what it would mean for education, for tourism, for research, if we would deploy the power of these technologies to our cultural heritage. We would be able to mass digitize our collections, automate the extraction of metadata. All of that is possible. We would be able to interrogate that data in unprecedented ways, perhaps even adding a fourth dimension to services like Google Maps, so you can actually enter into time. Market forces can be powerful allies in this new dimension, and we should be fully open to cooperations. There are services to be developed on top of our infrastructures that only driven, creative, and entrepreneurial companies are equipped to develop. But if we leave our digital transformation to market forces alone, without setting clear boundaries and develop our own narrative, we should be prepared to give up the sovereignty of our past and omit developing fundamental skills in our sector that will determine our future. If we want to retain our competitive edge in cultural heritage in Europe, we need to make deep commitments and investments in our digital futures, in infrastructures like Europeana, but also in ambitious projects like Time Machine. We should do all that or risk becoming what they're calling digital colonies of Silicon Valley. So to conclude, we have a window of opportunity to ensure that our work truly gets recognized as the transformative force that it can be for Europe. We cannot be complacent, arrogant, or lazy about this. We should not be shy about it either. We need to make our case. This requires Europeana to develop smarter, more attractive, simpler service architecture to make it easier for small and, and mid-sized institutions to be active on the web. It requires museums, libraries, and archives to make their collections available through creative partnerships and by using open standardized right to make statements where they can. But talk to your ministries. Participate in manifestos that are floating around these days. And make your case so that it becomes unequivocally clear that the European Union can make another bold and enlightened decision to once again fund and promote digital transformation on our own terms so that we can continue to empower our cultural health sector and unlock the tremendous potential, but from within, in the New Horizon program, in Creative Europe program, and in the Digital Europe program. I wish you a great conference. Thank you.